Hey y'all and welcome back to another new video. We are continuing on with our series on the Marauders today. Today we're talking about Sirius Black. If you haven't seen the two previous videos in this series, James and Peter's Life, definitely go check those out. And before we get started, make sure you like this video and are subscribed to my channel if you're not already, as well as hitting the bell notification button. And check out my link tree down below for all the other places you can find me. And without further ado, we can jump right into the video. So Sirius Black was born November 3rd, 1959 in London, and he was born to Orion and Walburga Black, um, who were dark wizards, as well as being second cousins. And he was the heir to the House of Black, which was once a very notable pureblood family. And Sirius was not close with his family at all. He also wasn't close with his younger brother, Regulus. Um, and his name, Sirius, was used at least three times in the Black family, and it followed the tradition of naming their children after stars, constellations, or galaxies. And the Black family were strong, pure-blood supremacists. Um, they blacked squibs as well as what they considered blood traitors, so like anyone that sympathized with non-pure-bloods out of their family tree. And they claimed to be a fully pure family, which is not true. Um, and they would even inbreed in an effort to keep their family completely pure. Um, and they held the dark arts in reverence. And from a young age, Sirius rejected these values, which led to a major conflict between him and his family. He was kind of the black sheep of his family. And the only member of his family he liked was his cousin Andromeda. And basically, Andromeda, and that kind of makes sense because Andromeda was later disowned for marrying the muggle-born Ted Tonks. So Sirius had a really, really unhappy childhood. He hated most of his family, especially his mother and his cousin Bellatrix. And all of his family was sorted into Slytherin, but when he started Hogwarts in 1971, he was sorted into Gryffindor House. So that even shows, you know, the difference between him and his family there. And he became good friends with James, Lupin, and Peter. And the four of them were inseparable, called themselves the Marauders. And just like the other three, when he discovered that Lupin was a werewolf, he became an anime guy in order to keep him company. And Sirius, his animagus form was a huge black dog, and this is when he took on the name Padfoot, the nickname Padfoot. And at some point, he also helped in the creation of the Marauders map. He was very popular in school, and teachers recognized that he was an intelligent, but they didn't approve of his behavior, so once again, kind of that class clown type. And he and Snape also hated each other, though James and Snape, James and Snape were more of the main rivals, and then Sirius just kind of hated Snape because James did, I guess. And Sirius would bully Snape, um, and sometimes he would do it just out of boredom. So yeah, I would say that the two of them were definitely bullies. I know some people might disagree with that statement, but that's kind of just based off of the series. Even if you think Snape deserved it or Snape was also a bully. Um, I would say Snape was also a bully, but yeah, it doesn't mean that, I don't know, I can just see people getting mad, <laughs> but whatever. Um, but later on, Sirius expressed regret over his behavior. So Sirius even recognized himself that he had been a bully as a child. He regrets, regretted his behavior and he even almost got Snape killed once. And this was that, that thing with um, the Whomping Willow when they told him to like go in there and then Lupin could have attacked Snape, but James pulled him back at the last second. And Sirius and James also bullied other students, including this boy named Bertram Aubrey, who they used illegal hexes on. And at age 16, Sirius moved in with James to basically escape the horror that was his family. And Sirius' mom blasted him off the family tree in response to this, but his uncle did end up leaving him a large inheritance which allowed him to move out and live on his own and become financially independent. And so after graduating Hogwarts along with his friends he joined the Order of the Phoenix and he and James one time got in a motorbike chase with Muggle police which was then crashed by Death Eaters on brooms and it caused like a whole huge upset. And whether they got in trouble for that or not was never said, I'm assuming that they didn't. And in 1979, both his dad and his brother died. Um, and Sirius actually never learned the details surrounding Regulus' death. So he didn't really ever know that Regulus had kind of turned away from the darkness, um, which I think is kind of sad. I wish he had gotten to know that. Um, and then he was also best man at James and Lily's wedding and was named Harry's godfather. And on Harry's first birthday, Sirius even gave Harry his first broomstick, which is really sweet. And Sirius was actually starting to become very mistrustful and paranoid, and by 1981, he no longer even trusted Remus, um, one of his like former best friends, and actually suspected him of spying and purposely excluding him from important information. Um, however, strangely, he still trusted Peter. I think they all underestimated Peter. They all just thought he was too weak to be the bad guy. Um, and so that same year, the Potters had to go into hiding under the Fiddleus charm, and James insisted Sirius be the secret keeper. But Sirius thought he was too obvious, so he said that Peter should take the role instead, and only the four of them knew of this switch, and even Albus and Remus didn't. And on Halloween 1981, 
Sirius went to Peter's hiding place, I guess just to, like, hang out. Um, but Peter wasn't there. So this, like, really freaked him out. And so he went, I think he was worried about Peter. I don't think he necessarily suspected him yet. So he ran to Goddard's Hollow to see maybe if he's there with the Potters. And when he gets there, he discovers that his friends are dead um, and the house is destroyed, but that Harry is alive. So I'm sure he was, like, really sad about his friends being dead, but I think his first instinct was to protect Harry. So Dumbledore had also found out, and so soon after, Hagrid arrives and tells Sirius that Dumbledore wants Harry to go and live with the Dursleys. Um, and Sirius wanted to take Harry since he was his godfather after all, but Hagrid eventually convinced him that Dumbledore's plan was probably for the best, so he eventually did concede. And he must have been like decently okay with this because he even gave Hagrid his flying motorbike to take with him. Um, and then Sirius was like, once Harry was taken care of, I think it really hit him that his friends had been killed and that Peter must have betrayed him. And so he is filled with like this whole, like hatred and this desire for vengeance. And so he wants to track Peter down and he's actually determined to kill him. So his goal was actually to kill him. I mean, like rightfully so. So he does track him down in London, but Peter outwits him, outsmarts him, causing that explosion that basically frames Black for all of it, for betraying the Potters, for killing Peter, for killing all these muggles. And so Sirius was arrested at the scene, and Barty Crouch Sr. sentenced him without a trial to life in Azkaban. So he didn't even get a trial, like a chance to say his piece, because they just all assumed he was just so dangerous. And even Remus originally believed that he betrayed him and betrayed them all. So Sirius was put into solitary confinement, and he was almost driven to insanity in solitary confinement, um, which is a good point because in real life, people are also driven crazy by having to be in solitary confinement. There's a lot of arguments that it's inhumane, um, even for prisoners. And so he stayed sane by focusing on his innocence as sort of a way to keep him tethered to reality. And he would also turn into his dog form because for some reason, the Dementors, they couldn't like suck the happiness out of his dog form as much. And they were also like, couldn't really see, so they didn't know he was in dog form. They just like, they thought that the reason his emotions seemed dulled was because he'd gone crazy. They didn't realize it was because he was in his animal form. So while he did stay tethered to reality, he was obsessed with what had happened that night and would go over and over it in his head just for years. Um, and in 1973, he did escape. So this is kind of basically how. Um, so first of all, people thought he was the first person to ever escape Azkaban, but that was actually Barty Crouch Jr., but people didn't know that um, because of that switch. I've talked about it in the past. And he had received a copy of the Daily Prophet from Cornelius Fudge during an inspection. I guess Cornelius Fudge had been there to inspect. He'd had a copy. I guess he just asked if he could look at it, and he said yes. And so on the cover, he sees Peter Pettigrew in his animagus form as Scabbers the Rat on that picture of the Weasleys in Egypt. And so he that like reawoke all his vengeance, as well as he was really afraid for Harry. So he turned into his dog form, and because he was so skinny from like literal malnourishment, he was able to fit through the bars of his cage. <laughs> And so that's how he escaped. And then he swam across the sea to the mainland, which like, I just don't know how realistic that is, but either way you did it, I guess adrenaline can be a real kicker. So he swims to the mainland um, and to freedom. And so he immediately went to Harry's neighborhood where he lived with the Dursleys and he did see Harry and Harry saw him getting like before he got into the night bus, but this really scared Harry. Um, and news of his escape caused widespread panic and people thought he might kill Harry or commit another mass murder and both the ministry and muggle authorities were on the lookout for him. So they even alerted the muggles that this man was dangerous. That's how scared they were about it. Cause it kind of seems that like um, high ranking muggle officials know about magic. So Sirius Black actually took refuge around Hogsmeade and in the Forbidden Forest. And he was spotted a few times, but Harry mistook him for the Grim, which is kind of funny. Um, and he actually became friends with Hermione's cat Crookshanks, which I wish they hadn't left out of the movie because it's so funny. And Crookshanks knew that Sirius Black wasn't actually a dog, and Crookshanks also knew that Peter Pettigrew wasn't actually a rat, and even tried to bring a Peter to Sirius, um, but Ron was very protective of Peter. And Sirius spent some time in the Shrieking Shack plotting on how to catch Peter, and so Peter had gone back into hiding, faking his own death. And when Sirius was truly desperate, he did sneak into Hogwarts through the passage from the Shrieking Shack, and he tried to get the fat lady's portrait to let him in. And when she wouldn't, um, on October 31st, 1993, he like slashed her up. And on a different scenario, um, like in the movie, they kind of mashed it into one. But yeah, so Slash is the portrait. She doesn't let him in. And then Crookshanks, oh wait, I think in the movie they did do it separate, but they did it like switched. I don't 100% remember, but anyways. So on a, then he goes and watches the Quidditch match between Gryffindor and Hufflepuff. Once again, Harry thinks he's the Grimm. And eventually Crookshanks steals Neville's list of passwords because like Neville couldn't remember the password so he wrote them all down. 
and takes it to Sirius so he can finally get into the common room that way and he basically tears Ron's bed up looking for Peter of course he's unsuccessful because Peter has faked his own death and is hiding in Hagrid's hut and in June Sirius saw Ron carrying scabbers after finding him in Hagrid's hut that night of um you know Buckbeak's supposed execution and so he basically grabs them both and drags them through the tunnel into the Whomping Willow. And eventually, you know, they all end up in the Shrieking Shack, Sirius, the trio, Lupin, Snape, um, Peter, and they reveal Peter's true form. They want to kill him, but Harry stops them from killing Peter, wants to give him to the mentors instead to prove Sirius's innocence. And so then Sirius invites Harry to live with him, and Harry says yes, and this is like such a sweet moment, but then it all falls apart when Lupin transforms into a werewolf and is out of control. Sirius then turns in a dog to try and get Lupin away from the kids. Um, and after this encounter, he was left very weak and could not protect himself from the Dementors. And so that's that scene when his soul is almost sucked out of him. But Harry's Patronus stops it. And Peter has escaped, obviously. And so with Peter gone, Sirius can't prove his innocence and was recaptured. Um, but using the time turner, Harry and Hermione were able to free him and he flew away on Buckbeak. So sort of a happy ending. But he now once again has to go into hiding because he is a wanted man. And so he gives Ron an owl in to replace his pet scabbers, which is kind of cute. And for a while he's hiding outside of Europe and we're never told exactly where, but Harry suspects it's somewhere tropical as indicated by the birds that he would use to communicate with them. And he would, they would communicate pretty sparingly just because they were worried about it being found out. But Sirius was always giving Harry, you know, fatherly advice. And he did return to Britain though once he suspected Voldemort's return to power. Once Harry's scar started to hurt, he did return because he was worried that Voldemort was coming back. So fast forward to the next year, Harry's fourth year in school. Sirius hides out in Hogsmeade during the Triwizard Tournament and the trio would visit him a few times and he would give Harry advice, including telling him things like that Durmstrang's headmaster, Igor Karkaroff, used to be a Death Eater and so to, you know, be wary of him, as well as other advice throughout the tournament. And after the final task, all and all that happened in the graveyard, Dumbledore actually summons Sirius to his office to speak with Harry, another thing they leave out of the movie. And Sirius stays in the hospital wing with Harry in his dog form, and he overhears Fudge accuse Harry of being dishonest about Voldemort's return. And so then Sirius and Snape sort of make up to an extent at this point, because they realize they're gonna have to like work together. Um, and Dumbledore basically orders him to go and like retrieve these certain people, Lupin, Arabella, Fig, and Mundungus Fletcher, because they're gonna have to reconstitute the Order of the Phoenix because Voldemort has returned. And so they use his family home at 12 Grimald's place as their headquarters. And he did accompany Harry to Hogwarts Express for his fifth year, um, but it was likely that Draco Malfoy actually realized who he was, and I'm not really sure how or whatever came about if, if um, Draco ever told anyone. Um, but just based off the comments he said, it kind of implies that Draco realized that that was serious somehow, because he says something like, nice dog, and then he says another thing on the train. Um, and so then they only communicate by OWL and Flu Network that year, and at one point Umbridge almost even discovered him, so they really had to be careful. And some people felt that Sirius actually treated Harry too much like James rather than acting as a father figure by him, and Hermione even felt that Sirius was trying to live vicariously through them and the rest of the Dumbledore's army, so people kind of had mixed feelings about him. And in the last year of his life, it actually seemed that he'd fallen into a great depression and had even taken to drinking. Like, one time they came over and he was drunk, so... He was having a rough go of it and i think a big part of this is because he felt really useless because since he was a wanted man he was never allowed to leave the house so he felt like he wasn't really able to do anything to help the order um however when the weasleys decided to spend christmas at his place that year because you know arthur had been in that accident and so um by being at in london they were closer to the hospital that really turned things around for him he made like a complete turnaround and was really happy i think to have people there um but then of course his life ends, Voldemort implants that fake vision into Harry's mind of Sirius captured in the Department of Mysteries, and so Harry and the others do go there, and Harry kind of cues in Snape to what's going on through like a secret message, and Snape realizes what's happening. So Snape alerts the rest of the order because Snape can't go himself, because if he showed up to protect them, it would give away that he was a double agent, but a lot of the other, or several members of the order show up, including Sirius. And during the battle, we see Sirius fighting with an unknown Death Eater as well as Antonin Dolohov. And however, he did eventually die when Bellatrix hits him with an unknown spell and he falls through with the veil. And then we do see him posthumously at the very end of the series when Harry uses a resurrection stone to bring him back. Harry asks Sirius, you know, does it hurt? And Sirius tells him no, it's pretty much just like falling asleep. 
And that's pretty much all we ever see of Sirius. I don't know about you guys, but that's personally one of the hardest deaths in the series for me. Um, I remember the first time reading it just being shocked. And I remember my boyfriend, he saw the movies before he read the books and like his first time seeing the scene, I just remember his face like mouth wide open turning to me being like, what is happening? Because it was definitely unexpected. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video and until next time, bye y'all.